this. President Biden's shaky debate reportedly worrying his former boss, President Barack Obama. According to the Washington Post, the former president told allies the debate made Biden's path to re-election even more difficult. Meanwhile, there are growing concerns about the president's performance on the world stage. Let's bring in retired Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, senior fellow at Defense Priorities. Colonel, good to see you this morning. Good to be here. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, so I want to play something from Secretary Blinken, uh, who has served this president and is continuing to defend him. Here's what he says. If you look at surveys around the world for what they're worth, um, you see again and again and again that confidence in American leadership has gone up dramatically over the last three and a half years. That doesn't just happen. It's the product of choices. It's the, the product of policies that we pursue. It's the product of our engagement. And they see President Biden having led the way in all of those different areas. But, Colonel, how do you think foreign leaders viewed that debate on Thursday night? What does it mean for us? Uh, well, I, I don't think there was any truth in, in any of the things he said in that whole uh, whole sentence there, that whole clip there, uh, and especially after the debate process. Look, that, you have to put him in a situation and, and imagine the president of the United States is not just supposed to give a good debate or just supposed to be able to engage with a foreign leader when it has to happen you have to be able to be proactive you've got to have uh, set the agenda you want to use diplomacy to push things in a direction you want and have a vision that people want to follow but right now he can't even keep his mind focused on a single sentence anything that he's saying and when he froze up there at the first of that debate that's only the latest in a long string of them and can you imagine if he's sitting there having a debate with, with Xi Jinping or with Vladimir Putin over something that could end up in nuclear war one way or the other, uh, you can't afford to freeze up or not be able to speak coherently. I think it's a real problem. Forget about the election. This is much bigger than that. Well, and here's the thing is that Wall Street Journal had reporting a couple of weeks ago that talked about this and about how his mind would wander and he would need prompting in certain meetings. I talked to members of Congress who said they were there to talk to him about issues of national security and they were very concerned about his ability to focus and do these things. So who's to blame that we're in this position now? Because um, this is the man on the ticket unless his party does something radical and he decides to step away. I mean, he is the one who has been for the last three and a half years negotiating all of those meetings that you talk about. Right. I, I mean, it's a combination. It's, it's, uh, it stops first and foremost with the president because he's the guy that's making the decisions. He's the one that's on the ticket. Uh, but then just right below that, it's the Democratic leadership because they, they've got to see that this is not something good either for the Democratic Party or for the United States. I mean, they, if you can't have somebody who's genuinely sharp and on top of this and can provide leadership in a world that's got so many potential wars that could float, that could suck us into any one of them, which would all be bad for us. You've got to have somebody who's on the top of their game. And right now, the fact is he's not. And I think something needs to change. I, I just don't see how this can continue on and us be safe. Well, former Defense Secretary Mark Esper has this to say about concerns about the president in this uh, format. It's very, very serious. I mean, if you're a, if you're a foreigner, uh, an ally, a partner, you're looking at this and you start questioning is, does he have the stamina to go another four years? And look, you can't help but answer and say no. Quick final word from you, Colonel. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know that they, I, it's questionable whether he can be successful in between now and January 20th of 2025. I don't see any prospect that he can go another four years. Hey, look, it doesn't matter who you want to vote for. You've got to have somebody in, in there that can do the job. Mm -hmm. Colonel Davis, uh, happy Independence Day to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks to you. And same to you, Janet. This is uh, Shannon. Mike. Shannon, the Biden White House descending into chaos as President Biden faces increasing pressure to drop out of the race. At least 25 House Democrats are on the verge of asking the president to end his bid for a second term, exposing deep cracks in the party's unity following last week's debate, along with mounting concerns about Mr. Biden's ability to carry out his constitutional duties. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Mike Emanuel. Dana and Bill are off today. I'm trying to bring It's so nice to get to do a show together. Great to be working with you. Yeah. All right. I'm with the best. The president now facing a possible mutiny on Capitol Hill, unless he can quickly restore confidence within the next few days. All of this happening, giving another boost to former President Trump after Monday's immunity ruling by the Supreme Court. And as President Trump moves to overturn his New York conviction, the judge in that case has delayed the date for sentencing. 
Here's Trump attorney Will Scharf last night on the Ingram angle. Now you're starting to see the dominoes topple in all of these other cases against President Trump. The Supreme Court stood up for the Constitution, for the separation of powers, and for the rule of law, and that they weren't willing to just rubber stamp these insane Jack Smith prosecutions. Eric Sean has more in our New York newsroom. Good morning, Eric. Hey, Mike. Good morning, Shannon, too. Uh, the Biden campaign, well, they're trying to quell the concerns about the president. Some top Democratic officials will see him later on today. Democratic governor set to go to the White House tonight for that closed-door sit-down meeting with the president. It is a chance for them to gauge him personally, face-to-face. -face. I think the, the governors just want a direct and, and candid conversation uh, with, the, with the president. Uh, we want to make sure he's doing okay. We all know him. Uh, he has formed a, a personal relationship with us, and he, and he says he is, and we take him at his word. Uh, but it's always good to see somebody in person. But this comes as a new CNN poll taken after the debate shows 75 percent of registered voters think that the Democrats have a better chance of keeping the White House if the president is not the party's nominee. And this comes as in the race for cash, the debate may have really helped former President Trump. At the end of June, his campaign says it has nearly $285 million in its coffers. That compared to $240 million reported by the Biden team. And the former president got another break with the recent Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. His sentence in his criminal trial in New York delayed from tomorrow to uh, September. And in her, uh, actually next week, and in her first public comments about her father's trial, Ivanka Trump is explaining why she did not show up at the trial and is not on the campaign trail. It's a pretty dark world. Like there's a lot of darkness, a lot of negativity. And it's just really at odds with what feels good for me as a human being. And, you know, it is, it, it's a really, it's a really rough business on a human level. It's my father and I love him very much. So it's, it's painful to experience, but uh, ultimately I wish it didn't have to be this way. As for the Biden campaign, it says that the president will not withdraw. This says uh, several newspaper editorial boards have been saying it is the former president, Trump, who should drop out. They cite his continuing lies and what they call his, quote, extreme agenda. Mike, back to you. We will follow it. Eric Sean, thanks very much. Sean. All right. Joining us now for more on this, Fox News contributor Jason Chaffetz. Um, Jason, welcome. You and I sat here on debate night uh, and did coverage of this. Um, we could see that night people were worried, and yet the ripple effect is turning into something different. Does he ride this out, or do you think there's going to be enough of a, um, you know, panic attack publicly from other Democrats that he's got to go? Well, five minutes into the debate, Shannon, it was clear that the president uh, does not have the cognitive capability or the physical strength to continue to be the president of the United States. I think it's 100% clear that there's no way he's got another four years in him. I think the biggest question now is, what's he going to do for the next seven months? Because he's struggling to get through day by day. And the reports we're hearing about how he's acting, who's in these meetings, what's going on, uh, really is a scary time for the United States. You need somebody to be able to answer that phone, make split-second decisions 24 hours a day, not just at certain hours, depending on how well he's napped uh, beforehand. Jason, you served with then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She asked whether this was a, an episode or a condition. What do you make of that? Uh, I, think she's, uh, I think she's lying. I think she knows the cognitive decline is real. Uh, I, to, to deny anything else, saying, oh, this is just a bad 90 minutes. I mean, think about all the excuses we've had. Oh, we had a cold. Then he went to the Waffle House and shook hands and did all that. And then the president said, well, he almost fell asleep during the... I mean, you're having the presidential debate and you almost fell asleep? I mean, do we believe him or do we not believe him? Then he said he was tired because of his international travel. That was two weeks prior. He flies on to Air Force One with a bed and staff at his, his beck and call. He spent eight days up at Camp David, um, reportedly not even getting up and doing anything till 11 o'clock in the morning. This is the most rigorous job on the face of the planet. And so for Nancy Pelosi to try to blame something else or change the direction, that's just Nancy being Nancy. And it, it doesn't make any sense to America. Jason, I want to make sure that we touch on the immunity ruling from Monday and how it's being played out publicly. Here's what the left says. 
the Supreme Court decided. It's above me now. It's above Joe Biden now. Don't care about Joe Biden's age. He could sit down. He could roll around in a, in a wheelchair. Donald John Trump cannot be allowed back into the White House. Apparently, a president is above the law. And he could hire anyone to kill anyone and be immune from prosecution. We're in deep people. Okay, Jason, if that's what it really said, I can be okay with understanding that people are that upset. That is not what the decision said. Um, but, you know, and I don't expect Rosie O'Donnell to go read every word of this decision, but that's what she's being told it said. So, I mean, that seems pretty divisive to the fabric of this um, country if you're misrepresenting what the Supreme Court actually did. Yeah, uh, they obviously didn't read it. I don't know that Rosie O'Donnell could read anything more than a, a, a TV script. Um, it's absurd. I think it, uh, it tears apart the country when you take a Supreme Court ruling and then try to totally manipulate it for pure political reasons within minutes after it's been, it's been released. That is not what the Supreme Court ruling says. I thought it was a very reasonable ruling. Uh, it sets clear guidelines. It's just common sense if you think about it. If he's acting on official acts, then he's got immunity. As president of the United States, if he acts outside official acts, then he doesn't have immunity. It's pretty simple. It makes common sense. It, this is not a ruling about Donald Trump. This is about all presidents, Democratic presidents, Republican presidents, well into the future. This is going to be with us for decades, and it was the right ruling by the court. Jason, Hunter, Hunter Biden's apparently dropping into West Wing meetings, helping to write speeches, uh, says he doesn't trust some of the president's advisors what do you make of all that? I think one of the scariest moments happening in the White House right now is that if the family, if Jill Biden and Hunter Biden, of all people, don't trust the senior staff, what does that say about where we are in the decision-making process? Who is actually making the decisions, the split-by-second, you know, split-second decisions that are going on there? Uh, Hunter Biden, in his nefarious background, he's convicted felons, I, I, to suggest that he would join on a telephone call, sit in on meetings, that is so fundamentally totally wrong. All right. Jason Japitz, always good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Millions of Americans set to hit the road for the holiday. If you're one of them, pack your patience because this 4th of July is set to break travel records. Jeff Flock is live from the Atlantic City Expressway in the beautiful Garden State with a look at the highways. Hello, Jeff. Mike, always good to see you. Not good to see brake lights, though, as we head for the uh, Jersey Shore. Maybe you see uh, a look out the window there. Yeah, this is the Atlantic City Expressway. This is the uh, pathway to the Jersey Shore, where a lot of people are headed for the uh, 4th of July. It is going to be an all-time record travel holiday. Take a look at the numbers. 60 million people, the uh, AAA says, will be traveling by car somewhere. Uh, another s almost 6 million by air, and then another almost 5 million by bus, train, or cruise for this uh, 4th of July holiday. They are uh, looking at gas prices that have been remarkably stable. Maybe not as low as we'd like, but $3.51, the average gallon of regular right now in the U.S. That's almost the same as it was a week ago, which is almost the same as it was a month ago, which is almost the same as it was a year ago. So stable, if not, uh, if not the lowest in the world. That uh, 60 million figure in terms of folks on the road being helped by those gas prices, up almost 5% from a year ago and up almost 10% from pre-pandemic, yeah? The AAA says we are back and we were actually at all-time records before the pandemic. Here's what they told us. Well, it's interesting that when we now compare post-pandemic to pre-pandemic, we're already comparing it to above average, and we're surpassing that. It's not only been high for road trips, it's been high setting new records for air travel. Cruising is back in a very big way. That's crazy. Talking about those uh, air uh, folks uh, that are in the air, yeah, 5.74 a million folks, that's up almost 7% from a year ago and 12% pre-pandemic. And good news, Mike, the AC Expressway has opened up. Well, look at that guy. There's a three-wheeler out there. Look at that guy. Jeez. Wow. Convertible. Who needs a convertible? Cool. Jeff Flock reporting live, driving, uh, at least in Jersey, you don't have to pump your own gas. Jeff, have a wonderful holiday. Be safe.
If you don't mind, if you could click the thumbs up button, guys, it really helps the channel. Thank you so much. We're gonna move forward. That's what we wanna do. We wanna look forward. We wanna turn the page on this. We really, truly uh, want to turn the page on this. I bet. Well, the White House gearing up for a high stakes meeting with Democratic governors tonight. Can the president ease their concerns? Meanwhile, does last week's debate underscore a failure by the media to hold the White House accountable? We'll ask our panel. And Florida's anti-squatting law goes into effect. How is it working so far? And could we see similar measures all across the country? Wow. A new Florida law protecting homeowners now in full effect. The legislation allows state law enforcement more power to help remove squatters from homes. Steve Harrigan has the details. Steve? That's right, Mike. Anti-squatter law is already in effect in Georgia and now in effect in Florida as well, trying to help the homeowners tip the balance a little bit back in their favor, trying to allow local law enforcement to get involved more quickly. And they come after some high-profile incidents, including one in a million-dollar house in Fort Lauderdale that had 10 squatters inside, including one of whom had false documents showing he was the owner. Local law enforcement initially powerless to do anything. Florida Governor decided Santa says uh, criminals are trying to game the system, and that time is now over in Florida. Here's the governor. You are not going to be able to commandeer somebody's private property uh, mm -hmm. and expect to get away with it. We are in the state of Florida ending the squatter scam once and for all. And new penalties for squatters can be steep. In Florida, it can be a felony charge depending on how much money and damage was caused. In Georgia, it could be one year in prison depending on what happens inside the house. That law could have certainly helped this woman who uh, says she offered to pay a squatter to leave her home. Wow. We offered her $750. Uh, we explained to her that this is our house. We are not a property management company. It's just us. Uh, this is the house that I lived in and offered her the money. And she said, that's not enough to put a roof over my kid's head. So I, I'm not going to take it. The law in Georgia gives squatters, accused squatters, three days to try and show proof of ownership or rent, or they could face possible arrest. Mike, back to you. Steve Harrigan reporting live. Steve, many thanks. So, President Biden scheduling a PR blitz to reassure the public after last week's debate as the White House faces a flurry of questions on the president's fitness for office. I wonder if there's been any consideration given to like releasing a more robust set of medical records or, or something to show his mental acuity. Do you see these as legitimate questions? Let me know in the comments, do you think that Biden should release medical records over what we saw in the debate last week? So are you being straight with the American people? Have you ever seen the president have a bad night like we saw on the debate stage? What medications was he taking in the days or hours leading up to the debate? Well, on the president's upcoming schedule, a taped interview with ABC on Friday, a solo press conference next week, and a meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu later this month. Let's bring in Will Kane and Howard Kurtz to talk about it. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Okay. Um, morning, Shannon. That interview on ABC is supposed to be with George Stephanopoulos, uh, as we know it. Now, here he is talking to Nikki Haley last year when she was raising concerns about President Biden's fitness. There is no way that Joe Biden's going to finish his term. I think Kamala Harris is going to be the next president, and that should send a chill up every American spine. Wow. But I also think the fact that we have a primary. Primaries well, excuse me, excuse me, one Americans second, Ambassador. How do you know that Joe that Biden's not going to finish his term? What is that based on? You ask Americans, do you think he's going to finish his term? It's going to be close. So, Will, from the time that that interview happened to the debate the other night, do you think that President Biden changed significantly or that George Stephanopoulos knew last year there was trouble? I think, Guys, if you don't mind, if you could click the like button, the thumbs up button, it really helps out the channel so much. Thank you so much. Stephanopoulos knew last year. I think almost everyone dealing in reality is known for several years. I will say, Shannon, I think there has been a rapid increase in the rate of his decline. I saw a video from back in February, and it's it's worse today than it was in February. But it, we're not going to live in, in um, uh, 
alternate reality that he was somehow sharp as a tack right up until this debate. That's true. What you're seeing there is the alternate reality, the lie painted by the mainstream media. All of a sudden, they've come to Jesus, and the knives are out. I mean, they are really coming after Joe Biden. And so you ask yourself, if you didn't know for all this time, but now you're willing to admit the truth, is it the concern for the country? And were you concerned about the guy leading this country and whatnot he was up to the challenge? Are you just concerned about an election? I think they're just concerned about losing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to that point, let me read something from um, Jill Abramson, former New York Times editor, saying this. It's clear the best news reporters in Washington have failed in the first duty of journalism to hold power accountable. The president's decline was a super hard story to report, even by those who wanted to get it. If enough reporters had pushed, the story was reportable. It is laughable and immoral for Democrats to blame the press now for overreacting to that reality. I mean, Howie, wow. the reaction after the debate last week was, you know, shock, and this is terrible, and he's declined. And uh, But the fact is, I, it seemed to me... People have known he was in decline. Mm -hmm. What they were upset about then is that then the American people knew what yep. they already knew is that he was in decline. Well, the reason you saw such outrage questioning of Karine Jean-Pierre is that reporters in that room feel lied. They feel mis lied to. They feel misled. And, you know, this was an unmitigated failure by the media to uncover, to penetrate what was a White House cover-up. But... It is, as Jill Abramson says, a very hard story to get. And that's why I constantly question why his team kept uh, the president bubble wrapped and away from the press. That was very telling. Uh, this also, you know, most journalists, and I've covered and known Joe Biden since the 1980s and his first campaign, didn't have any access to the president. We watched on TV with everyone else when we saw the deterioration and the confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the White House would also push back very hard at any age-related story. And look at the denunciations of the Wall Street Journal piece mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago, which accurately reported that behind closed doors, Biden was slipping. So, Will, we are going to get access next week when there's Can a I press say... conference. Yeah, go ahead, but I'm going to ask you how much pressure is on the president to deliver during that presser. Please. Okay, I want to address the media, and then, and then I'd love to address the president and the Democratic Party. So first, Howie, I mean, I think, I think we can admit a couple of things are true at the same time. Uh, number one, they hid the president. They kept him in bubble wrap. That which you say is true. Number two, the administration lied to the press on a, on a regular basis, and by extension, the American people, about the president's security. But number three, we're not going to sit here today and pretend like this was a hard story to report. That somehow you couldn't penetrate the, the obvious common sense I Guys, if there's anything that we've seen, there's already been a lot of evidence of what Biden showed in the debate. We've already seen it for the past year. But there, the other left, the left side media is making it out to be like it never happened. Years of everyone understanding the president's mental acuity. In fact, the, pres the press was a willing mark. They were partners with the administration. The AP, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, they all ran stories a week and a half ago about cheap fakes when it came to videos showing us, again, our eyes and our ears, the reality when it came to President Biden. I have no patience for the press. I have no forgiveness for the press. They helped perpetrate this lie on the American people. And then really quickly, Shannon, to the president, What's fascinating to me is the president really doesn't need to impress upon Americans now some, some reality. He doesn't have to convince Americans. For all their talk of saving democracy, Shannon, you know, including they'll do anything to save democracy, including to discredit the Supreme Court of the United States, they're now ready to set aside democracy. You see, Biden was elected democratically in a primary, but now the media elites and the political elites have said, well, we're going to lose with Biden, so they can just set him aside? That seems to me incredibly anti-democratic. So what I would say is Biden has to impress upon his donors, the media elites, and the Democratic Party that he can win. Yep. It is a full-fledged campaign that will have to do convincing in the days to come, starting with that meeting with Democratic governors tonight. Gentlemen, thank you. Will, I'll see you later on your podcast. And Howie, I'll see you down the hall. Thank you both. All right. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> I know I'm not a young man. I don't walk as easy as I used to. I don't speak as smoothly as I used to. President Biden still in major damage control mode after his disastrous debate last week. Now he's blaming his foreign travel for sapping his energy. But will that raise even more doubts about his stamina? Plus.